I think the question becomes not only like how long would it take you just to sit down and prepare for the MCAT itself, but how much time do you have before you're actually ready to apply and where would the MCAT fit into that? Dorothy, welcome back to the MCAT podcast. How are you doing? Hello, hello. I'm doing great. How are you? I am wonderful. I'm excited to wrap up our kind of starting the MCAT prep journey series here with our friends, the non-trads, or as I like to call them, the old pre-meds, because that is just a fun brand that has been out there <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> I, I, um, we're putting together our, our new conference for next year, MAPTCON 2023, mm-hmm. in person, which is phenomenal. I'm super oh, excited. And, yeah. and the first night, we're going to have some some old pre-meds um, uh, scheduling, some programming for, for the non-traditional students. <laughs> some, somebody was like, can you please not use the term old? How about mature <laughs> or wise? I'm like, nope, it's old pre-meds. That's what we're going with. Um, just, we love them for Just it. have some fun. <laughs> Just have yeah. some fun with it. Um, so our, our friends, the non-trads, they are potentially traditional students turned non-traditional because they're delaying their MCAT prep while they're taking classes and working and other responsibilities, whatever. Or it could be a 40-year-old career changer. Yeah. Let's let's talk about the career changers um, because the the other people out there – maybe have a little bit more of an idea if they were pre-med before or maybe just struggled, they had to do a post back, whatever. Let's talk about the non-traditional student who is, they, they've been an architect, right? I gave that example last episode of like, I was an architect for my first two years and now I'm, I'm coming into my junior year going, yeah, just kidding, I wanna be a doctor. Maybe they are an architect. They're out there building buildings. They're not falling down. They're doing a great job. And at some point in their life, they go, you know what? I want to be a doctor. Mm-hmm. Call me crazy, but I want to go back to school, <laughs> subject myself to all of that fun stuff. I, I want to be a physician. Mm-hmm. Where do they start? Yeah. Um, so I think the framework for these um, applicants is a little bit different from everyone else, right? They've had this whole career. They've had so many more experiences under their belt, and now they're pivoting to medicine. And so I think a lot of like their application comes together with like their story and their personal statement and kind of like what they bring to the table outside of medicine. Um, and so the MCAT for them is really just an, a time to like prove that they can keep up with the sciences and keep up in that way. And, um, and so uh, for a lot of people that I've talked to as well. Um, I do have some non-trad classmates, which is really fun, um, just to hear about their stories and hear about their experiences. But um, I think one big thing for them is it's okay to recognize like, hey, I haven't seen this material in X number of years. It's okay to spend more time just relearning the basics, going back to the sciences, um, relearning and spending more time in it. And I think just building a good foundation is really important. And so um, depending on how long it's been since you've been in school or um, your familiarity with the topics on the MCAT, um, it might be a case where you just need to give yourself a little bit more of a longer prep period, a little bit more time to study, if you know that you'll be doing a lot of that relearning right off the bat. Yeah. So relearning right off the bat. And it's not, maybe not even relearning, it's learning for the first time. Oh, so depending on yeah, they, they they may need to, to take all of this in. And so- in general, the way that I like to talk about non-trads is is kind of let's let's fit you into a framework of are you a first year, second year, third year in terms of the general work backwards timeline of sure. when do you want to start medical school and, and does that align with when you can start medical school depending on all of those prereqs that you need to take, right? So if you already have your degree, you're an architect, you already have your degree, but you don't have those core prereqs that we were talking about in our last episode of like, these are the classes you need for the MCAT and they mostly align with the classes that you need for medical school. It's bio one and two, uh, chem one and two, physics one for the MCAT, but but two also for medical school. Yeah. Uh, OCHEM one and then two for medical school. Biochem uh, and then psych social potentially if you can fit that in there or you, maybe you took it a, as an undergrad already. And that's that's a lot of classes 
I mean, that's I didn't, I, I was supposed to be counting, but I forgot to count. <laughs> I mean, that's that, there's like six or eight classes that a student needs to take, and those are really heavy, hard classes that include labs, yeah. and so you're not going to get those done in like a semester. Maybe two yeah. at the, if you're like you're going hard two semesters, that's going to be really crazy. But it's probably going to be three or maybe four semesters comfortably. And so when you look at that, then maybe you consider yourself maybe a, a, a late freshman, early sophomore in terms of your timeline and go, OK, I'm going to go back and listen to the sophomore episode. And that's kind of where I'm at timeline wise to start thinking about this because I need to go get my clinical experiences, some shadowing, maybe some research if I want. Uh, but I, I need to basically start over uh, on my path. So the, the non-traditional student is really just a disguised traditional student. We just need to figure out where to put them in the traditional timeline. Is, is that an interesting way to think about it? Definitely an interesting way to think about it. I do think you have a lot of good points though, because there are just I know a lot of us have talked about it, maybe maybe implicitly or explicitly, but this idea of like some sort of like unspoken checklist for things that you have to do for the, for med school, right? So as you mentioned, like clinical experiences, volunteering, shadowing, research, as well as all the prereqs um, that you need just for med school alone, not, yeah. not even just to mention like things that you need explicitly for the MCAT. Um, it does take time and um, it's something that most pre-meds take the bulk of their college career preparing for. Yep. And so uh, kind of transplanting that similar timeline to um, a non-traditional student is also pretty appropriate, I think. Um, so yeah, I think the question becomes not only like how long would it take you just to sit down and prepare for the MCAT itself, but how much time do you have before you're actually ready to apply and where would the MCAT fit into that as well? Yeah, I would love to see a tool. Maybe it, we kind of have map. That's kind of what mapped is for is that this roadmap kind of thing. But I'd love to see a, the tool maybe built into mapped of uh, I'm a non traditional student. Here are the prereqs that I have. Here's what I don't have. So basically, like looking at the the study planner tool that blueprint MCAT has, but for the whole journey of like, Here's what I have. Here's what I don't have. Here are the the time requirements, my my responsibilities with work and family. So it's like do some number crunching. I'm like, okay, you have uh, basically eight hours of of classes available for each semester. You have uh, twenty credit hours that you need. Therefore, it's going to take you two and a half years, whatever uh, of 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 classes. And then MCAT prep and all this stuff. It'd be interesting to to have a tool that's like tells you exactly yeah. when you're ready ready to apply based on your availability. So yeah, we'll, sure. we'll, we'll work on that uh, with yeah, uh, so with that. <laughs> looking forward to mapped in 2025. <laughs> yes, and and that's that's an important thing, right? Is is we didn't even mention the the classes that these students need to potentially go back and and take for the first time, probably. And so maybe they're a non-science major, non-science career, and now they're jumping into the science world for the first time. So there's going to be a, a pretty steep learning curve, even though that doesn't make sense mathematically. It's a sh very shallow learning curve because you're not learning very quickly. Um, I, I always was like, why do we call it a steep learning curve? Steep learning curve to me means you learned it very quickly. Uh, anyway, um, so the that that learning is there the science is there the classes are there the other stuff is there the the extracurricular activities but then they're non-trad maybe they have a family and they're the breadwinner and they have to keep learning and working to yeah. to stay the breadwinner until they start medical school when they can get loans to help support their family and stuff it's like how, how are they supposed to do that? and then you're telling me i have to take the mcat on top of this yeah <laughs> Yeah. And so I think this is where a lot of non-traditional students really struggle because like, yes, in theory, I know all the things I have to do, but I have work or I have school or I have family or I have whatever fill in the blank and other obligations to take care of, which just sucks away time and emotional energy and mental effort. And those are all things that you want to protect as much as you can when studying from the MCAT. So it does become like you just have this additional burden that's not just like being a full-time college student um, that comes with being non-traditional, which makes it a lot harder. Um, I think that is also where just very strategic time organization comes into play, especially for non-trads. Um, if you're trying to just organize your time around all of these other things you have going on concurrently. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. So, yeah, so what's hard. a what's a mistake potentially that you you would see a non traditional student make? Obviously, the the standard mm-hmm. mistake of focusing too much on content review, not on practice questions. What what other big mistakes specifically for non treads might you see? Yeah, so I think a lot of non treads. One thing um, that I've noticed that a lot of them are in work or school, and so they'll like just block out like one chunk of time towards the end of the day for them to just do MCAT um, just because that's the time that doesn't conflict the most with other obligations going on. It can be really hard though to be able to just have the focus and energy in order to like have good quality studying during that time. Um, and so what I recommend for a lot of my non-trad students is to break up your study time. Mm-hmm. If you are um, a person who can get up early in the morning, maybe knock out like an hour or two study session in the morning, um, do some CARS practices, um, just things that require more intensive focus, and then like have little chunks of time throughout the day where you can just take a break from whatever you're doing um, and study a little bit rather than like one huge chunk at the end of the day when you're already pretty tired. Um, Not to say that this is easy, but I do think it helps with the mental framework of just being more engaged and focused during the time that you are studying um, versus not. Yeah, I I see not only students chunking time at the end of the day, I'll see often where they won't study during the week and then they'll spend all day Saturday studying. Mm And then to me, I kind of think back to my like exercise physiology roots. And if we're only studying one big chunk once a week, how Mm -hmm. useful is that? Are we retaining information? Are we building the skills necessary to learn new stuff and build upon it? Or are we kind of forgetting every week and we have to to rebuild and rebuild and rebuild? And and it's like kind of running up a hill with soapy water (laughs) streaming down. You're just like (laughs) trying to get a hold of something. Yeah, that's a, that's a great visual. I do think like MCAT in itself is already kind of an uphill battle. So if you're making these big chunks of progress during the on the weekends, but then not doing anything to maintain it or to like continue like actively practicing the things that you learned over the weekend, then you kind of start slipping back during that week. And then you have to make up that extra ground again um, over the weekend. So I think depending on schedule, it can potentially make sense to do a lot of studying on the weekends, but then to have some sort of maintenance throughout the week, whether it's like flashcards, making study sheets, reviewing study sheets, doing like one video or one module, right? So doing a little bit every day, um, or even just doing like two practice passages a day. Um, If you have... 30 minutes to an hour to spare, um, that could be appropriate. So yeah, I think maintenance and consistency certainly um, is more important than just the sheer amount of time you spend in a week, even if it is chunked into like one or two days. Yeah. Yeah. And I would love to to uh, fix that language for mm-hmm. the student. What what you just said, right? If you have 20 or 30 minutes to spare, whatever whatever it was, right? Sure. Nobody has 30 minutes to spare. Yeah. Right? That's like, I, 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 I need to find 30 minutes. Like you'll never find it. You need to make 30 minutes. You need to yeah. go on your calendar and say, these are the 30 minutes that I'm dedicating to MCAT prep. And you, mm-hmm. you work your calendar because yeah. if, if you don't schedule it, it's not gonna happen because time will fill up all of the other spaces, right? Uh, it's always things to do. Par- sure. Parkinson's yeah. law is is a fun law <laughs> that I talk about all the time, where the time required to do a job will expand to the to the mm-hmm. time that you have available to do that job. And so, unless yeah. you are very intentional with your time and you use time blocking as an amazing skill that I'm still trying to work on, of like, okay, during yeah. this time, this is what I'm working on. I'm like, ah. What's on my phone? I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, you you really yeah. just have to be super intentional about it and and make the time to do it and don't just go. Yeah. Oh, I'll I'll find thirty minutes. I think tomorrow. Like no, it, yeah. it's not going to happen. Yeah, I think that's a really important part of like holding yourself accountable too. Like if I go back to my MCAT, like the my personal calendar when I was studying for the MCAT, I actually did block out. So I think I tried studying like three to four times a day, each like an hour ish. Um, and I was taking classes at the time. I was. Um, part-time working as well. So I would be like seven to nine 30, like cars slash whatever. And then like, I'd put that in my calendar in the same yeah. way that I put in my classes. Exactly. And then I'd have like another session during the day. Cause if I didn't write down like and plan out when I would study, it wasn't going to happen. And then I'd feel bad about myself the whole day, not really be productive at night when I tried to just 
make up for the rest of the day. So yeah, I do think it's really important to just plan out the times that you are going to study, even if it is an hour um, every day. I think that yeah. is so much more helpful than just blocking it out into one or two days a week. It's huge. Definitely huge. So good. All right. We got that down. Let's talk about the general timeline. We've, we've talked about kind of three to four months for MCAP prep, but that's like I'm a traditional student, I don't have other responsibilities, I don't have family and work and all these other things. What potentially would you see as a good timeline for someone who does have all of these other responsibilities? They they are working, they do have kids, they uh, are, are at home doing whatever, right? They, they, they just have a lot going on. Is it is it appropriate to go? Okay, we're gonna stretch your MCAT schedule out to a year. Like, is that too far? Like, where where's that balance of of responsibilities and MCAT prep? Uh, effective MCAT prep, I should say. Yeah, for sure. Um, I do certainly have students who have pushed it out to a year. Um, that usually isn't the initial plan, though. Um, so the initial plan is usually somewhere from like six to nine months. If they are non traditional, if they do know they have a lot of content to learn. Um, up front. So I think six months to nine months is usually like the longer end of um, prep planning, at least from the beginning. And then of course, it, being flexible and extending that as needed. Um, I think the reason why maybe not a year is because a year can feel very far away. Um, and so I think a lot of students benefit from like a little bit more of that like time crunch of like, oh, I'm taking it in less than a year. Like I need to start being more diligent and like more, you know, on top of my studying, so on and so forth. Um, if you break it down into hours, so if we kind of say, okay, for the average MCAT student, they're studying for maybe 300 plus hours for the entire MCAT prep period. Um, in a three month period, that's probably upwards of, I wanna say like 20, 30 hours a week. Um, if you do the math and break it down into six months, that's about 11 to 12 hours a week, which is maybe like, two-ish hours a day, right? So kind of just thinking through like what amount of studying you can commit to reasonably during your prep period. If you are working, if you are in school, if you are dealing with all these ob other obligations, maybe 12 hours a week is pretty reasonable or maybe it needs to be a little less and then you can stretch out your period accordingly. But I think I would caution against just starting out saying like, okay, a year from now I'm taking the MCAT because it is quite a long time. I think it is, um, it leads to potentially less accountability and less being on top of it. And yeah. um, when you know that it's- <laughs> I got time, I got time, I got time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, and I say hard. that because that was me. Um, mm -hmm. I definitely put my MCAT um, knowing that I had more time than I, um, yeah. or thinking that I had more time than I did. Yeah, uh, I, I sing the praises of the Blueprint MCAT study planner tool all the time. It's a free tool, go sign up for a free account. Does how far out does that tool go? Can I like schedule out? Like I'm going to take the MCAT in a year and a half. Will it space out the content in that way? Do you know? It actually will. I've yeah. tried playing around with it saying like, I'm going to take it in 2025. <laughs> <laughs> and you see like one video every other day. <laughs> nice. I can, um, I can manage that. <laughs> so yeah, the beauty of the blueprint tool is that it is super, super customizable um, to your studying, to your plan, um, and kind of how many hours per week, what days you want off, and so on and so forth. Um, so it does give you that flexibility. Again, maybe wouldn't recommend planning it out for over a year. <laughs> yeah. for now. But it is definitely an option if you know that like that would be ultimately more conducive to you being able to just get the content done, have time for practice with your schedule. Yeah. All right. That's that's the non treads out there uh, who are coming back to this world and, and they have a lot to do. Uh, but if it's what you want to do, you'll figure out a way. Uh, we're, we're working with, a I think, a 50-year-old right now um, wow. through our advising services who's like, he's a lawyer. He's like, I want to go to med school. So I'm like, sure. Wow. Okay. We'll, we'll help you. Yeah, <laughs> we'll help you. So there there are plenty of amazing non trads out there doing their thing. And hopefully that will be you too, who's listening or watching this. Uh, Dorothy, any final words of wisdom or encouragement for those non trads? Um, you got this. I have so much respect for you. I think just as you go through, continue to just remember like what is um, motivating you to pursue this other path? Like what is motivating you to continue down in medicine? And when it gets hard, just continue thinking about that. Let that inspire you and pave the road forward for you as well. Always keep that why near and dear. Absolutely.